Come with me. I want to take you back to one of the most difficult moments of my life. It was March of 2012. I was sitting at my computer screen and I was staring at a letter I spent a long time struggling to write. And as hard as it was to write it, it was even harder to find the courage to press send. That's because this wasn't an ordinary letter. This letter contained a secret, one I spent my whole life trying to protect, trying to keep hidden. And I knew that once it was out there, my whole life, my whole world was likely to change. So I agonized over this letter. I read it over and over. And then one night, I just gathered up all my strength and I just hit send. Phew. Right? I'm supposed to tell you my secret was out there. I felt this overwhelming wave of relief. But I didn't. I was terrified. And rightfully so. You see, I knew that this letter would change the way people saw me, and I thought I was ready for their judgment, but nothing can prepare you for an overwhelming tsunami of hate. Senseless, blind, crude as it may be, still absolutely devastating. Still, it's one of the best decisions I ever made, and I'm going to tell you why. I'll give you some context first. I'm Egyptian. I'm a proud Egyptian. I'll always be a proud Egyptian, even if the Egypt that I grew up in became increasingly rigid as I aged politically, socially, religiously. The powers that be create an environment that choked the freedoms of millions of people. Anyone who didn't fit into the uh, normal narrative that they set for us. Anyone who dared challenge those in power, certainly. But not me. I mean, I was safe. My grandparents were famous celebrities, literally revered in Egypt, and as their grandson, I inherited this admiration. In fact, I was often referred to as Egypt's favorite son. You know, growing up a Sharif in Egypt, that's kind of like being born a Kennedy. Or, look at me, more of a Kardashian, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. The point is, wow. The point is I had every opportunity in my life. I got to be an actor from a young age a spokesperson for top brands, even an underwear model. I've since rediscovered carbohydrates. <laughs> so we're going to leave my shirt on. But the point is, if I wasn't overly exposed, I was certainly visible. But I was also forced to be invisible. You know, being in the public eye, people thought they knew me, but they didn't really know because I couldn't let them see. I mean, yes, I'm Egyptian. Yes, I come from this famous family. But like I said, I have a secret. I'm gay. This is something that I kept hidden because it didn't fit into the Egypt that I knew, the Egypt that scoffed at human rights and persecuted people who were different. You know, being gay in Egypt technically isn't illegal, but the LGBT community lives in near constant fear. They're often arrested and charged with such crimes such as obscenity, prostitution, inciting debauchery, and so forth. You know, I remember as a teenager watching the news and seeing coverage of the Cairo 52 when a disco called the Queen Boat was raided on the Nile, 52 men were arrested, charged, tortured, and ultimately convicted of these crimes. Even the ones that were ultimately acquitted had the names dragged through the media, their reputations destroyed, they were forced to undergo invasive medical examinations that are tantamount to torture, according to Amnesty International. They were rejected by their families and by society. I always worried that that would be my story one day, that I would get caught that same way. I heard similar stories for years. If you look here, this is a still image from a news report just three years ago. The journalist, I'm not going to give her credit and I'm not going to name her, she orchestrated a raid of a bathhouse with police. They marched in, they handcuffed all these men, they paraded them out naked while filming them, and they accused them of homosexuality and spreading AIDS in Egypt. That was the headline story on the nightly news. The story, by the way, was completely fabricated. None of these men were even gay. But the hate that drove it and the fear that this instilled, that's very real. And it was absolutely devastating. Even more recent images. Look at these men being dragged into jail just last year. Look at the way they cover their faces with their shirts or their hands, hiding their shame and leaving observers to imagine that these men could be anyone. Debauched radicals, deviants, anyone except for brothers, sons, or grandsons. So as you can imagine, I felt pretty isolated and lonely in my country. 
and I felt like I didn't belong. And it may sound trivial to you, but the only source of solace I felt came from watching Hollywood films and TV shows, shows like Will and Grace. Seeing scenes like these of people living openly and authentically, being embraced by the people around them, they provided me with great comfort and hope. They reminded me that I wasn't alone, that different isn't bad, and that there was a community out there, even if it was thousands of miles away, that loved and supported the invisible me. In 2012, I saw a glimmer of hope. As many of you know, this was a time of great change for our country. We were in the midst of a political revolution. Behind us were the jubilant celebrations of Tahrir Square, but ahead of us lay uncertainty. There were hopes that things would change. There were calls for a more open and tolerant society to come, but really it was anyone's guess what life would look like in the wake of revolution. It was a formative and fragile time for our country. And that's when I knew that I had to add my voice to those calling for an open and inclusive Egypt in that moment. I was a public figure. By virtue of my ancestry and my career, I was given a platform, I was given a voice, but with a voice comes a responsibility to use it. So I wrote my letter, I came out, I revealed my secret. With the eyes of the world watching, I demanded that equal rights be given to all our citizens, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or what have you. You know, I knew full well from getting my master's degree in politics that when entrenching constitutional principles, if a group is excluded from the outset, it could take centuries before the issue is revisited. The piece immediately went viral, it went global, it was trending, it was number two on Yahoo, number three on Twitter, and I was being inundated with hateful messages from all sides. They ran the gamut from snide comments to death threats. And it was impossible to know which threats were real, which were credible, but they were so constant and so extreme that one thing became immediately clear. It would be a while, if ever, that I would get to go home. I still haven't been home, not even to attend my grandparents' funerals. I fell into a depression. I had suicidal thoughts, but almost worse, I nearly convinced myself that I should have never hit send. But then something wonderful happened out of the blue, like so often it does. Maybe I'd miss them in the avalanche of hate, or maybe they came later, but soon I started to see messages like these. There were a few of them at first but their impact on me was huge. They convinced me that I made the right choice and they put something into perspective that has been at the heart of everything I've done since. Just the same way that I had TV shows and characters that I could relate to while growing up, I realized that maybe my story could help others feel less alone. Emboldened, I became the national spokesperson of the world's largest LGBT media advocacy organization, where I hone my skills and my messages as I prepare to push for equality back home in the Middle East no small task, I assure you. And three years later, I was ready to confront my demons, and I conducted my first Arabic-language TV interview live as an open and proud and visible gay man. It was a show with millions of viewers, some four million people tuned in live, some 20 million people tuned in later. But what was important about it is that it was going to be the first time that many people in the region heard directly from an LGBT person, speaking openly and authentically as someone they watched grow up from a young age. I gave them a face, someone that they could recognize. Again, I was scared. I was inviting a reaction, so I prepared myself for another onslaught of hate, and to be sure, it came. But this time, it was diluted with an unexpectedly strong wave of support, even more messages like before, messages like these. A lot is world and changed in the world since then. In some places, life has improved for LGBT people. But in Egypt, the situation has regressed. Today, amidst a new and particularly brutal crackdown against the LGBT community, the pendulum has really swung back in Egypt towards government-mandated discrimination and intolerance, which means that once again in Egypt, silence feels like the safest option. As many societies, rightfully frustrated by a slow and painful pace of progress, have discovered, the LGBT community makes the perfect scapegoat. Deviance? 
debauched radicals whose only real crime is believing that we should be free to live in the same relative quiet that we have for generations, free from the terror that the slightest gesture or glance might betray us. I try to offer LGBT Egyptians a form of hope that I can believe in, that the entire history of human progress is a continual journey towards inclusivity, that once people have had their first taste of love, of community, of a chance to live their authentic identities, of freedom, that there is no dam on earth that can ever hold that back. The tide of tolerance is inevitable. And I've never been so optimistic. Because I stand here, I look to you, to Taiwan. After nearly drowning in a sea of hatred, I now stand on an island of hope. In historic fashion, Taiwan has the opportunity to prove that love always conquers hate. That whether foreign or domestic, hate groups pouring money and bigotry into a country, they cannot slow the wave of progress. Taiwan's democratic values and inclusive inclinations are way too strong for that, and they will only become stronger. What many people often forget is that we do not seek to destroy society or societal values. In fact, just the opposite. Marriage equality only makes for a stronger country. Marriage strengthens families, and stronger families make for stronger communities, and stronger communities make for a stronger Taiwan. This has been proved time and again the world over. We just need to get that message out. We need to come forward. We need to stand up. We need to march in prides. We need to share our stories. We need to vote, and we need to be counted so that we finally count. We are not faceless men. We are brothers, we are sisters, and we are fellow citizens. Meet us. Hear us. Help us. Join us. Join us in spreading this wave of equality globally. Share your stories. Stories hold incredible power. And with the power of new media, this power has been dispersed to all of us to share our stories, to create change, and to accelerate acceptance. My story is just one out of many millions. But that doesn't make it small. That's what makes it huge. I'm not alone. We're not alone. And together with our stories, we will continue to inspire millions more and spread this wave of equality globally, one victory at a time. Taiwan first. Thank you. <laughs>